Uh, firstly, thanks uh, to the speakers for the invitation. It's, uh, uh, I've been waiting for two years to come here, but it, it gets delayed. But finally, we are here. And it's uh, very nice to be, meet all the people. It's uh, one of the nicest community. I, I always feel like coming uh, to this community again and again. OK, so uh, I'll be talking about uh, sort of a very special problem, which, uh, uh, which we started doing as a, with one of my master's students with Parthenil. And uh, then it turned out to be extremely interesting. It's a bit of an exotic, uh, uh, as I say, like it will it'll be of like infinite progeny mean, which is not really considered to be interesting, because whenever we try to do uh, many things in uh, branching processes, uh, we always assume it has finite mean. But uh, this is kind of very special where you have infinite progeny mean. So I'll try to convince you in uh, before the coffee, uh, at least that there, there are certain interesting uh, things which are happening. So this is a joint work with uh, uh, the master student I was speaking. He's now a PhD student in Stanford, uh, uh, Shovik Rai, and Parthenil Roy, who is a very well-known uh, funny guy in uh, this community. Uh, and uh, Philip uh, will help me with the questions, who is in the audience also. And, uh, so there are four versions in the archive. I'll, I'll slowly tell you uh, why there are four versions uh, of this paper. Oh, sorry. Uh, the recent version came up like uh, a day back in archive, and it's the fourth version. And I hope it's the final version. And uh, the paper is this. Uh, it's under revision, but uh, uh, we initially started with uh, the first version has like 39 pages. Then it reduced, uh, the second version is like 19 pages. The third version is like 20 pages. And now we are again 35 pages. So, uh, so it, it keeps on, because all has different methods of proof, uh, all the versions. And finally, we feel that we have the right uh, way to tackle this problem, uh, at least. OK, so let me tell you briefly about uh, what is the branching random walk mechanism. So, uh, so what you do is. Uh, so these are, you think these straight lines as, uh, I hope I have the pointer, but anyway, so yeah. So these straight lines as the copy of a real line. And what you do is you start with one particle, which is the root, which is the dot, which is pointed there. And I'll, I'll tell you what these green lines are. So what it does is uh, at time t is equal to 0, you have just a single particle, which is uh, this. Uh, uh, point, and then this point splits up into uh, some number of particles. Here in the picture, you see only two particles, uh, and they displace. So I put the green line to make sure that you understand that there, there is a displacement from the origin, from the original place where this single particle was. So uh, let me uh, try to, ah, here. So, so if you put this point here, so you see that this is the displacement from the original particle this makes. So you can think that uh, in the second generation, this particle dies, and it, it places two more particles on one on the positive side and one on the negative side, you can think. And, and uh, this will continue. So these two particles, again, independently, gives rise to a few more particles. And this goes on, and, and they all make displacement uh, uh, in the real line. And, and if you see, oops, sorry, uh, if you see this, uh, so this particle, so this red part, I will call it the displacement from the parent. So this particle, uh, its parent is this particle, and this red line is the displacement from the parent. And if I take the total distance of uh, all the sum of the, all the displacements, then this particle is at this position. So I use the term, technical term, as position. So this is the position of this particle. So, and and I, I call these times as generations, because as you can see, it will give you a tree structure, which, is, uh, which will be like a Galton-Watson tree. So, so what, what do we have? So we have a tree structure, which is given by a Galton-Watson tree. And we have a collection of displacements for each of these particles. And this system is sort of thought of as a branching random walk. 
And uh, in general, what we'll, we'll assume, a crucial assumption, is the displacement is independent of the branching mechanism. This is not a, uh, we work with this, uh, with this mechanism where the displacement is independent of the uh, branching mechanism, but uh, there, the standard literature doesn't assume that. So it's, a, it's one of the, we may, it's a easy, to make calculations easy, we, we do this assumption. So let me go to the formal. So this was a pictorial picture. So, so what we do is we uh, mark these positions uh, by a Galton-Watson uh, tree, which is given by this uh, bold uh, T, which is there is a vertex set, and this is E. And for each vertex, uh, V uh, will, this is the particle. So which I'm saying that this is a particle. So this V is a particle. And we identify the, so let me go to the picture. So this, so if I tell this is the V, this will be the corresponding, uh, so if I tell this is the V, this will be the corresponding edge to it. So this is the, this is the, like this is its parent, so this is its edge. So to a vertex, you always associate the edge which is to the parent. And uh, uh, we always assume that the, this uh, Z will be the progeny random variable for the branching mechanism. And uh, Zn is, uh, this is the standard notation, is the number of particles in the energy generation. And Z0, for example, is you start with one particle, which is the root. And Z1 is, uh, uh, is uh, distributed at Z. And you go on with the recursion equation, which uh, uh, you saw in the last lecture. And uh, we make a simplifying assumption that the tree is infinite always. So uh, we, we, uh, we hide all the other conditions and we assume that the, our tree is always infinite. And, and there will be another random variable, which is the displacement random variable, xe. So to each edge, you associate uh, a displacement random variable, uh, uh, xe. And we assume that these displacement random variables are uh, iid. So I'll, I'll, I'll show you more on this z and x. So just to introduce, so, so we have an interplay between two random variables. One is the branching random variable z, and another is the <coughs> displacement random variable x. And we'll put some assumptions and play with them. So, and uh, okay, sometimes there will be a simplifying assumption x greater than zero, but that's not needed uh, generally. So just to bring in few more notations, so this was our tree. Uh, whenever I pick a vertex V, I associate, when I do a right zero to V, I associate a geodesic path which goes in this red line you see. So this red line is the path from the vertex V to the origin. So this is the unique path which goes from V to E. And mod V means the generation. So for example, this is the generation three. So this mod V is three in this picture. And the positions are given. So the positions are given by the sum of the displacement uh, random variables along this path. So what we have done is along the, each of these edges of the tree, we have put in IID displacements. And uh, so, so you can imagine this is the sort of, okay, I have, it's a, it's a pictorial. There are ways to enumerate the Galton-Watson tree, but this is just a edge one. I'm giving a random variable xe1. Then you have xc2, and then you have xc3. So if I, if I look at the position of sv now, so, so sv is just the sum of xc1 plus xc2 plus xe3. So that's the, that's the position of, of the particle v. So what are the questions we'd be interested in? Uh, so this is, this is the system of branching random walk we'll be uh, talking about. One of the most interesting question is, uh, what is the rightmost particle? So in this picture, if you see, so this is sort of the rightmost particle, and these are growing. So as the generations increase, so they are growing. So you, you ask, how, what is the speed of this uh, largest uh, or the rightmost particle? How does, what, what can you say about the fluctuations? And uh, what can you say about the second, uh, 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 second rightmost particle? So these are all captured in, in a, question which looks at a point process of these displacements in the nth generation. So you can consider SV to be the positions. Uh, you, uh, you might consider, if you are not in the heavy tail regime, you will not need a, a centering, but 
in the light field regime, you'll need a centering and scaling, and you, you look at the point process of this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, positions, and, and then you ask, where does this point process converge to? And, and if you know the answer to this question, then the following questions like order statistics and the gap statistics, they, they come immediately, which are quite important in, in the physics literature uh, as, as such. So let me, I'll be not, uh, not uh, uh, I'll not justify like, uh, uh, because this literature, uh, as you saw in the, uh, in the previous talk, there was a bracket with, uh, because there are too many names. So, but I'll try to put in few names, and many names will be missing, so I apologize for it. So, uh, so, so, so the system of uh, this branching random walk was studied, uh, started with uh, Hammersley, Kingman, and Biggins, and our talk will be mostly related with the results which were obtained in these papers, uh, uh, in a way. And uh, also branching random walk, so there is a literature, it's, this is 70s, but branching random walk uh, came from another uh, process which has a similar branching mechanism which is called the branching Brownian motion, where you see there is a Brownian motion which is moving and then splitting up into certain particles and each of these particles again move in a uh, branching way. And, and this, is, this is much older. So this was uh, in fact started by, uh, uh, it's related with this uh, famous equation which is called the FKPP. And, and this was uh, studied extensively in the thesis of uh, Bramson in 1978. And the probabilistic connection with this, so this is a sort of a, it's a, it's a partial differential equation. And the relation to probability was uh, uh, proved in this paper by Lally and Silke. Uh, and coming back to branching uh, Brownian motion, so uh, the point process questions were answered in this, uh, uh, amazing uh, series of papers by Argan, Bovier, and Kistler, and also by Aidekon, uh, 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 Brunet, Julian Beristiki, and Jean C. And uh, so there were uh, properties of this limiting point process, which are known as the Brunet-Derrida conjectures. So, so it was, uh, so they mainly conjectured for the branching Brownian motion. And some of them were proved uh, 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 also uh, recently. And, and uh, they, they uh, conjecture about certain stability properties of uh, uh, these uh, limiting point processes, which are quite interesting. I'll not go in this talk uh, on, on highlighting what, what these Brunet-Derrida Brunet conjectures were, uh, uh, but uh, uh, people studied more about extremes and the point processes. Here are a few names among this. Idecon is one of the like, uh, leading names uh, in this area. Uh, Madol uh, in 2017 also studied the point process, and there has been a recent uh, uh, work by also uh, Bandopadhyay and uh, Partho Ghosh, uh, who uh, who studied it it through smoothing transforms, the recursive equations you you saw in the previous lecture. So, uh, so and 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 there has been also in the when your displacement random variables, these xes are heavy tailed. So this is the case when you have light tailed, and uh, when you have heavy tails, uh, Duret was the first one to study the uh, extremes of this, uh, and, and we made a progress in the uh, structure of the point processes, and we uh, tried to get an analog of the Brunet-Derrida conjecture, and, and we are successful in, in doing this with uh, Oyon Bhattacharya, who was a student of Parthenil, PhD student of Parthenil, and, uh, uh, so, and, and there are some very interesting uh, work which are going on in the large deviations of uh, this uh, la branching random walk. And so there are some recent work by uh, uh, these, uh, this group uh, by, with uh, Nina Ganter who, has, who are doing quite an interesting uh, job. Uh, okay, so, so just to give you a glimpse of uh, uh, the results uh, one, one obtains in this, uh, in this case when we assume that the, the branching random variable has finite mean and uh, the displacement is heavy tailed. So, so heavy tailed I mean that they are regularly varying random variables and, uh, and the branching has a, uh, the standard keston stegem uh, Z log Z type condition. Then you can show the, the point process of these displacements uh, 
converge to a Cox cluster process. We have seen uh, this kind of uh, uh, point processes, so I'm not writing in details the structure of this point process, but it's, it's very much related with uh, what we are seeing in uh, Ania's talk and, and uh, other talks. Uh, so it's a, it, it's, a, it's a Poiseur process with uh, lots of cluster in it, and you can characterize exactly how, how it looks. And uh, from here, the consequence is, uh, a main consequence is what uh, Duret derived in 1983 is the, is the position uh, of the rightmost particle scales like mu to the power n by beta. So th this beta is the exponent of the displacement random variable. And it goes to a, a, a sort of a mixture of a fresh air distribution. So now what we want to do is uh, we want to consider uh, very strange case where the branching random walk don't have a, a, a finite mean. And the problem is like we were stuck in, we thought about this problem and many people asked us uh, in various conferences what happens when, you, when your branching random variable doesn't have a finite mean. We had no clue because, uh, because most of the probability books you open up, you study about Galton Watson tree and and the first thing you assume is they have finite mean. And I, I had no idea about how even, what is the growth rate of the largest, uh, of the uh, number of particles in the end of generation. So at that time, we were given some references uh, uh, by some people, and we started looking in, and, and it turned out to be very interesting. Uh, so let me tell you the result. Uh, this is, a, this is a, just a uh, Galton-Watson tree result. It's quite interesting. There are some series of papers by, uh, uh, by uh, Barber also, Andrew Barber worked on this. But one of the nicest uh, conditions uh, one can uh, find is in this paper by Davis in, uh, uh, in 1982, uh, where he says that, okay, so this is a, still a simplifying assumption. He has much more complicated assumption on the tail, but I'm, I'm just simplifying things for you. So if you assume that the branching variable has, a, has roughly a power law tail, so you don't need a precise that it's n power minus alpha. And uh, so if it is a power law tail, so this assumption already says because your alpha should be between zero and one, so the mean is infinite. In this case, you have that the number of particles in, the, uh, in a generation plus one, if you take a log of it, then it grows at the rate of one by alpha to the power n. So it's a, it's a double exponential growth. It's, it's not only exponential, it's a, it's a double exponential growth, if you see. So essentially what happens is the number of particles in the nth generation, they are, they are becoming very, very big. And, 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 and this is quite an interesting phenomena uh, in a sense that uh, you still, it's a, it's a result like which we learn about uh, through Martingales uh, uh, for the standard Galton-Watson tree that Zn by mu to the power n, when you have a finite mean, converges to uh, a, a positive random variable uh, w. But you cannot generally use a martingale technique immediately to prove this, because you don't have a uh, finite mean. So you need to uh, use a Tauberian kind of Laplace transform estimates to uh, prove this kind of result, uh, which is quite in, uh, uh, innovative. And you may ask, like, where this kind of situation, can you give me an example where this kind of situation arise? Yes, it, it, uh, it turns out that uh, there are places, especially in today's world, where such a situation arise, especially in random graphs. So if you have a huge network and, and you have certain events happening, so what you see is there is a sudden growth in the branching mechanism locally, which kind of corresponds to an infinite Galton-Watson tree. So for example, like uh, somebody uh, wins uh, a lottery or something like that and you see immediately or, or somebody, some guy releases a fantastic movie in Netflix, you immediately see that the number of followers increase from 200 to 2.5 million in, in, in a matter of like five days. And, and this can happen only if you have an infinite mean when, when if you have a branching mechanism there. So this kind, in today's world, this is becoming quite important that you have double exponential growth in, in certain, uh, certain cases. Even like you can think of like even the COVID, like it was growing very fast. It, people were saying it's exponential, but sometimes it might be double exponential also. So 
Okay, so an easy consequence of this is to just to keep in mind that if you look at the size of the uh, uh, this uh, Galton Watson tree up to the n minus one of generation, and if you divide it by the last generation, then it goes to zero. So that means the total mass of this uh, tree is very much concentrated only on the last generation, and and you can compare the sizes only in the log scale. So this this is a bit different from uh, what happens in the Galton Watson case, uh, the, the standard finite mean case. So here you see that the last generation is dominating. Now this was our hurdle in the first review of the paper because uh, when you put this lemma, the referee immediately said, ah, everything is then like IID random variables in the last generation because your last generation is the one which kind of will dominate everything and the rest of the tree will not play a role. And now we have a answer that it's not entirely true. There are uh, much more complicated. But this is, a, this is a consequence which should be kept in mind, that the size of the last generation is quite big than the, all of the rest of the part of the tree. Okay, so the first result I go is, uh, so we have this, so we'll, we'll keep this uh, random variable. So we'll have this uh, Z as the sort of the branching random variable. And uh, x will be our displacement. So this will always have infinite mean. In fact, it will have the Davis condition. So we'll not change this condition. So now what we'll do is we'll change the condition on the displacements and try to see what kind of results we can obtain. The first result uh, is uh, when you take the displacement random variable to be heavy tailed. So L0 is a slowly varying function for me. So in this case, the heuristic works very nicely that if you look at the displacement of the nth generation and then you scale it by the, uh, the number of particles in the nth generation to the power one by beta. So Zn is like the, is, it's the number of particles in the nth generation. Then it kills every other thing and you are just uh, with the edges, uh, with the, just the variables on the nth generation. So, so if you think like, so xc here is just, so you had a tree like this, and so this is the nth generation variables, so you are just left out with the last generation there. And, and this heuristic works very well. Uh, you have to do some work to show that this point process is close to this point process, but uh, uh, if you see our second version, we reduced the proof and we got a, a kind of easier way to uh, do this. And, uh, and this, this is a collection of IID random variables. So we know the standard theory says that it's a Poisson random measure with a, with a power law uh, intensity measure. So this is kind of, uh, this is the first result where you don't see the effect of uh, any of the influence of the tree on the till the n minus one generation, and only thing you see is the last generation, which is kind of dominating there. And uh, so this is, the, this is the final result, which says that the point process, if you scale it by a random scaling, which is Zn to the power one by beta, then it converges to a Poisson random measure tau beta. So one question can be that, uh, like, can you do it uh, with, a, with a deterministic scaling? Not here, not in this case. I, I don't think we can make a deterministic scaling here. So some consequences is that uh, the m maximum after random scaling uh, converges to the Frechet distribution. And if you take a log of the maximum or the kth maximum, and if you scale this uh, with one by alpha power n, then it converges almost surely to uh, this W. So this is like the Kingman begins result, which gives you the almost sure result of the log scale of the maximum. So you have to, to get, a, get to almost sure, you have to take a log scale here. Otherwise you don't get a, don't get a almost sure result. But this is the begins Hammersley uh, Kingman type result where they, where they showed a strong law of large numbers for the largest displacement. But here you have to show the strong law in the log scale. So, and the, and the rate is quite explicit. And this, uh, this is essentially following from the point process. You have to just uh, do a bit of Borel-Cantelli lemma uh, to get, get to this. 
Okay. Yes. This W, this, this W is more related with the extinction probability. So it's a, it's the probability. So W is 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 the random. Way. It's positive when the tree survives. So it's a it's a, it's not very explicit. W is not very explicit, but comes out as a. Uh, it's not a martingale limit, but one can show that there is a W there. So it is not regularly varying. No, I, I don't think it's regularly varying. It's a, it's hidden in Davis's proof, which we don't. Uh, exactly understand like uh, it's uh, it comes from uh, the proof in Davis. Any any further question? Yes. Any alpha is one with a sin coming to the like L of M the denominator. Oh, that that's a very difficult. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I would guess that uh, that would be so. You have to assume uh, something on the slowly varying part also, perhaps to. Uh, uh, it's not slowly varying part. If you are first line. Yes, Pareto case, uh, I don't know. Pareto case. Um, uh, right. But first thing, uh, in the alpha is equal to 1, the, the Davis result and none of this result in the literature, they don't cover the special case of alpha is equal to 1. So it's, it's a, so if you have a good master student, you can try, uh, try to give it as a, <laughs> as a tough exercise that what happens to the Galton-Watson tree uh, when you have uh, the progeny distribution is just Pareto, like uh, uh, Pareto one. So this is not known. Any any more questions? Uh, please feel free to ask questions. I'm not in a. I can I can go to the thank you page anytime. So it's uh, and and will be redirected to the archive paper. So it's not a problem for me. Okay. So so we are we are so uh, this this story about the displacement random variable being heavy is is sort of not very interesting here. It was in the finite mean case, but in this case, it's not very interesting. The interesting part comes when you take a light tilled uh, random variable. And then all our intuitions started failing in the first uh, thing. So, so we have uh, certain names uh, uh, which we came up with, but they might not be consistent with the literature. So we, we, I'll explain what do we call the x to be a rapidly varying tail. So here is the definition. So again, the displacement, the branching is again uh, sort of Pareto in the way in power minus alpha. So the displacement, what we do is we take the log of the tail distribution, uh, so log of the uh, tail of the displacement random variable, and we assume it to be the negative of this to be regularly varying random variable with index r and r not restricted between 0 and 1, but also any, any positive r, so any positive r for some slowly varying function. And uh, so you can see, so I'll, I'll consider some examples. For example, uh, l is equal to 1 and r is equal to 1 is the exponential case. r is equal to 2 is sort of the Gaussian case. So you, you slowly see that uh, this kind of thing. We have a technical assumption on the left tail, which is just to, uh, uh, it, it, this is not much of an assumption, because most of the random variables will satisfy this. So the result says that under these assumptions, if you take the left continuous inverse of this, uh, this distribution or this function k, uh, the, which I call it L, not to be confused with a slowly varying function. So this is the left continuous inverse. So if you assume that this k is regularly varying r, then l is regularly varying with index 1 by r. So it's the left continuous inverse. So, uh, so it's uh, under this condition, if you scale the rightmost particle with l log zn, then you converge to two different types of con con constants. Uh, depending whether r is 1 or r is less than 1. When r is less than or equal to 1, you get a constant which is 1. And when r is greater than 1, you have a very non-trivial, non-intuitive uh, constant, which is given by 1 minus alpha to the power uh, 1 by r minus 1 to the power 1 by r minus 1. Now, uh, I'll comment on why this is happening, the transition between r less than 1. You could already guess, so, uh, there are many experts here, that uh, like r less than 1 in this assumption means that you are still in sub-exponential class. You still have the principle of one large jump helping you. 
and r greater than one is really the pure light tail case when you don't have the principle of one large jump. And then you see uh, certain contributions which are, which are coming in. So, uh, so under that assumption, so let me give you some examples. So the r is equal to two is the case when you have a standard Gaussian. And in this case, you see, so the largest uh, or the rightmost particle, if you scale it by square root of two log Zn, this is the correct scaling for the IID case. So you know if you take x1, x2, xn to be IID Gaussian, you know the largest, uh, the maximum of them behaves like square root of two log n. So this is the correct rate. Uh, the two log Zn is the correct rate, but it, it doesn't converge to one. It converges to one by square root of one minus alpha, which is, uh, which was strange for us. In fact, in, 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 in the second version of this article, uh, we, we made a mistake and we had it to be one because we thought that the last generation is the one which uh, kind of contributes. Then we tried to, uh, uh, we, we, we made a mistake by uh, trying to use a comparison lemma from uh, Li and Zhao and, and they have a typo in the paper. And, and that typo is, uh, we, we should have understood that the next theorem doesn't have the typo, so it's just a small typo. But we copied the result and we got that this constant is one. And somehow Philip, when he was visiting Calcutta, I think he, uh, he spotted this mistake and, and uh, we were clueless for a long time before our brilliant student came up with uh, uh, wonderful proofs. So exponential case is simple. Uh, it's again like the scaling of the IID case and this converges to one. Uh, so, so let me compare with the existing results uh, how this rate behaves uh, and uh, whether this rate is consistent or not. So it was proved uh, in a paper in, uh, uh, by Nina Ganter uh, when you have finite mean that the rightmost particle uh, kind of in the stretched exponential case, that is the case when r is less than one, the largest uh, max, large, the, the right displacement kind of uh, behaves in this way. So m power n in the light tail case is the number of particles in the nth generation. So this is kind of very consistent with what we get. And, and this comes from, so well, our case and Nina's case are both like principle of one large jump. But they, try, they have improved this result, which you could not, and sort of this is an open question in our setting. So they have now shown that the, uh, in the case when r is less than two third, you have a centering and scaling which uh, makes it converge to a mixed Gumbel distribution. And uh, in the case when you are, r is greater than two third and one, they have a second order. They don't have the uh, fluctuation result immediately, but uh, uh, exact fluctuation, but they have a second order which kind of uh, gives you a correction to this constant uh, uh, in this way. So, but in our setting, this is kind of an open question. We don't have an uh, answer to this uh, kind of uh, results uh, in our setting. Okay, so uh, any, any questions? Otherwise, I go to the last part of, of this. Talk, uh, yeah. yeah. So, what do you mean, mixed Gumbel distribution? So, no, it's a, it's a, so it's a Gumbel distribution where you, so it's like, a, so it's like e power minus some random variable times e power minus x. So, so there is a, there is a mixing uh, term which kind of comes in the, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a random shift kind of a thing which comes in, uh, in this distribution. Okay, so uh, so now what we consider is, uh, this is a question which the referees asked, uh, what can you say about uh, very rapidly varying tails? I'll explain what do I mean by very rapidly varying tails. So, the, so our branching is same. The displacement random variable now is again we take log of the tail of the displacement and we assume that the, the L is, which is the uh, left continuous inverse of k is slowly varying. So this is lot, sort of the r is, uh, is equal to zero case and, and, uh, and we have a technical assumption on uh, existence of a sequence, uh, but you can forget about this technical condition, but this technical condition is very crucial, which uh, can kind of controls uh, the maxima in a way, and, and it's, it's quite difficult to get 
construct such sequences always. We will give some sufficient conditions on constructing such, such sequences where you have this uh, kind of uh, conditions. This summability condition is needed for the Borel Cantilly lemma. So, sort of uh, we, we need to go to the almost sure, that is why this kind of uh, summability conditions are needed. So, the result says now the largest, uh, the rightmost particle, now you have to scale by sum over k 1 to n L of alpha power minus k, then it converges to 1. Now, you can notice that this is, uh, this is a very strange scaling in the sense that in this case, all the generations are contributing to the rightmost particle equally. So, in the sense that, so the last generation has alpha power L of alpha power n, the second last generation has L of alpha power n minus 1 and till the, till the topmost particle. So, so, every generation seems to have a contribution to the rightmost uh, particle there. So, so this, is, this is a very strange phenomena for us because uh, it's, it's nowhere related with the, uh, uh, nowhere related with principle of one large jump or, or where you can use a truncation or anything. So, so it's, a, it's, it's, uh, it's very counterintuitive in a, in a way. But once you do the computation, you see that really this comes into uh, play. And, and just to give you some examples where uh, this kind of, uh, uh, one can construct a, a sequence like this is, so you take a, the slowly varying function, you take, uh, for example, the Karamata's representation, which is uh, the standard representation like this, and you put a, put a condition on this function epsilon t uh, to be growing less than log log t. And uh, then you can construct a kappa n, which is like 2 log n, and you can show the maximum converges to 1. And an example of this situation is that f x is, so the distribution of the tail function is like log x power beta with beta greater than 1. And, and using this result, you can actually find the exact scaling. So, so all, all this abstract scaling kind of uh, gives you a quite uh, exact uh, thing. Whenever you take a specific example, you can compute uh, this. And uh, yeah, I had a, another one, that's what I missed. So another example is uh, if you take a greater than 1 and you take the function x going to L of a power x, this is regularly varying of index gamma and you can construct a kappa n which is like n and then you can show the maximum scales in this order. So you get a variety of uh, scaling and uh, uh, so and an example is e power exponential c x power beta. So, the, so these are variety of examples where you can, we can, you can apply this uh, result. So just, uh, I think I have five minutes uh, or something, yeah, okay. So I'll, I'll briefly sketch uh, the idea of the proof when you are taking this to be a regularly varying case. And uh, uh, so just, uh, just a brief idea on how to do it. So what you do is you truncate the tree at the uh, n minus k generation from the top or k generation from the below. And now what you do is you look at the n minus k generation. So there are some crosses here. So the crosses are, so what, what are these crosses? So, so there are certain particles in the n minus k generation. You don't take all the particles. What you do is you take the largest zn, so there are zn minus k many particles. You took a little less than the zn minus k many particles. That is zn minus k to the power 1 minus delta k. So delta k is a number between 0 and 1, which is, which is like you don't know, but you, you choose a fraction, say delta k is half. So you choose root zn minus k many particles among this. And this bold, uh, these are all children's of these cross terms. So you have chosen a, a, a some number of particles. Now the double exponential growth allows you to choose enough number of particles. So you, you have a lot of particles in this cross. The picture shows only five or six, but you, you'll choose like uh, thousands of them uh, if you choose like this. And bn minus k is the set of all children. And and now in the next step, so this is the first step. So you choose certain big elements from this set, this generation minus k, and you said bring a collection which are the children's of these big displacements. And then what you do is you go on repeating, you choose 
another fraction of uh, large elements from these children. So Bn, so you name the set as n minus k minus k plus one, which are the set of vertices whose displacement from the parent are the largest uh, Bn minus k minus one. So which is the this generation uh, one minus delta power k many. And then you keep on. So what you are doing is at each generation you are choosing a very large sets and you are trying to create a path of very large, so where you have large displacement from the n minus k generation to the last generation. So essentially, so what you do is you create a path like this, this green path, which is where all the displacements are quite big. So, so that, that's the idea of creating a ray from the n minus k generation to k generation. So essentially, the maxima kind of lives on, on, on uh, this kind of uh, rays. So and for the lower bound, so which is kind of tricky, so what you do is you, you have the, you are looking at the maxima of the energy generation, then you restrict uh, it to these kind of large sets, which is a lower bound, and this, so you split the maxima uh, into two parts, which is like the maxima till the n minus k generation plus uh, the terms here, which are the minimum of these displacements, but these are light tail displacements, though. So the maxima and the minima behave in the same way. And, uh, and this part, first part is non-negative, so it just amounts to estimating this uh, kind of expression where you get a very, very complicated expression. And what you have to do is then optimize over all the possible uh, choices of delta 1 to delta k, which is, a, which is a very difficult optimization in a way if you don't see it for the first time. And you get that correct constant. So it's a, it's, it, the all credit goes to our master student who is doing some sort of a combinatorial optimization and he came up with this kind of an optimization trick. So I'll skip the upper bound, uh, which is, and say that you will need a six cup of coffee to read the paper. It's, uh, maybe we, uh, we write it more clearly in the fifth version, but, uh, but uh, yeah. And I'll stop here with, uh, you can glimpse through uh, certain open problems here and uh, thank you for your attention.